You have the program. You don't. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So my name is Dan Hamilton. I direct the Center for Transatlantic Relations here at SICE. I think uh, people know uh, we have uh, done for many years a, uh, a major focus on the Western Balkans as part of our activities. And uh, this is part of that series. Um, we also uh, have our Mediterranean Basin Initiative. Which it looks at uh, the entire Mediterranean both north and south banks, east and west, and how that is changing, all those dynamics. And as part of that, we uh, have various events and also awards, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, but uh, today our topic is whether the Western Balkans are part of Europe. Uh, I thought that was a question we had resolved uh, some decades ago. Uh, in, the w in the aftermath of the Kosovo War, um, that was still the question, whether we were just sliding from one conflict to another because we didn't have a sense of where this part of Europe belonged, or whether we had a real strategy for the region that eventually, of course, it had to be part of the larger continent and, in, and its institutions. And at that time, uh, I do believe the United States had to push many of our EU colleagues uh, to, to really pose that question. Do you believe the Western Balkans are part of Europe? And depending on how you answer that question leads to a lot of policy implications. And uh, many of the people in this room were part of that. Uh, and I have to say, because it's a particularly personal moment for me that many of the people who are here today, including Tom and others, uh, played important roles at that time to get us on track after those tragedies. Uh, and there, there was, a, at least from a U.S. perspective, a generation of American Foreign Service officers who really uh, had to dedicate themselves to what the U.S. role would be to get out of those conflicts at the time and to get us all on track toward a better future. So today we're honoring Hoyt Yee, who's with us. Uh, Hoyt was part of that in different capacity, but there are a number of people here and uh, all the ambassadors are here from the region, and I want to welcome you all. But I, I just want to take one second to uh, note that the Americans in the room who had been in the State Department at that time, and some still are, uh, really played a heroic role, in my view, watching them as one of their colleagues at that time. I just want to mention that. Uh, and Dan Serwer, who is my colleague here, uh, also was uh, active uh, then as well in the State Department, also on these issues. So uh, he uh, and I, uh, we are putting this on together with our colleagues at SICE. Um, Dan's going to moderate this panel. Uh, and uh, then afterward, we're going to have our presentation of our award uh, to Hoyt Yee. Hoyt, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to just say hello now and get out of the way, and I'll turn it to, to Dan. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to moderate this panel. I haven't seen Tom in some time. Uh, uh, Nebojša Todorovic is a new friend, and it's a pleasure to, uh, to be able to welcome him here to SICE. And of course, Mike Halsell. Um, uh, Mike, I think we met uh, 30 years ago, more or less. <laughs> since, uh, since you're 43, I don't believe it. Uh, I won't, I don't want to let the opportunity pass without mentioning the extraordinarily positive news that we had yesterday about uh, the name issue. Uh, I think it's uh, really quite remarkable and positive that the Greeks and Macedonians appear to have come to a <coughs> satisfactory conclusion, a uh, conclusion that I have to admit my counsel advocated many, many times. Uh, but the, the important thing here is not the particular formula, it's the political will that's been mobilized to make this happen. And I can only hope that that political will carries over into two parliaments and into a referendum in Macedonia. And I think 
we, we have real reason to be happy if that takes place. It resolves one of the last remaining real war and peace issues in the Balkans and uh, leaves us room to tackle what I regard as the remaining two, which are Kosovo and Bosnia. Uh, with that optimistic introduction, uh, <coughs> let me just say a word about Nebojša. Nebojša Todorovic has until recently served as Assistant Minister of Health in uh, Montenegro, but he's uh, not talking about that. Today he's talking about uh, Montenegro's prospects uh, for the EU and uh, the, the, uh, the new element in the EU path for the Balkans. While I agree with Dan, of course, entirely that this question of Europe or not is entirely resolved in principle. In practice, it faces a lot of difficulties, and one of those difficulties, frankly, is the Russians. So uh, who have taken a quite a different attitude towards it than they took uh, once upon a time. So uh, we'll look forward to Nebojša presenting first. Uh, we'll then turn to Tom Countryman to open the aperture a bit for the rest of the Balkans and uh, for comments to, from my council. Nebojša, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure and privilege to talk uh, here at John Hopkins University on this very actual topic. And over the years, CTR and John Hopkins University played an important role in, sh in shaping opinion about importance of this uh, region for stability in Europe. And I would like to thank you all for your commitment and for your work. I would like to greet uh, Tom Countryman and Hoyt Yi as well as uh, Dan Hamilton, Sasha Toperich, Michael Halsell, and Daniel Selva. I also want to thank Embassy of the U.S. in Podgorica for their help in facilitating my stay here in D.C. And finally, I would like to address three topics. First, about, first uh, sh a short review about Russian politics in Balkans. Second, uh, about Russian modus operandi today within the Western Balkans, stressing on the latest events secured <coughs> in Podgorica, and third, what is necessary for a full su success story from Montenegro's point of view and uh, possible <coughs> benefits for both sides, Montenegro and uh, NATO. And if we want to give a short definition about the relation between Russia and the Western Balkans, that would be, there is no brotherly love, as some Balkan country would like to say. There are just interests, but the interests are not forever. The Russian interest in encouraging the Balkan uprising against the Ottoman Empire in 1711 was crucial for establishing relations with the countries of the Western Balkan. From then till now, the Russian presence has changed, but Balkan, uh, but Balkan remained one of the priorities of Russian foreign policy. The ideological matrix varied from panslavism and orthodoxy to communism in the time of the Soviet Union. Post-Cold War, Russian foreign policy includes periods when they behaved as a liberal democratic country that, uh, that joined the resolution of the U.S. Security Council, but also a period of radical deviation in relation to the Western policy toward this region. Montenegro is no exception. Russia is now looking on Mon at Montenegro as an open issue in international relation, which can serve an auxiliary tools uh, in balance of powers. This is a lesson from history that we never have learned well. By contrast, Montenegrins view themselves as engaged in century-old struggle for independence and freedom. Moscow from 2000 emphasized that is, it is of fundamental importance to preserve the territorial integrity of Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, that is Serbia and Montenegro, and to oppose the partition of the state something that is far with the threat of emergence of the Balkans conflict with unpredictable, unpredictable <coughs> consequences. This went directly against Montenegro interest, but Russia preferred to influence one country rather than two, 
particularly when the Montenegro was rapidly turning to the west and leaving Russian orbit. <coughs> when they realized that Montenegrin independence won, was an unstoppable process, jump on the bandwagon. But shortly thereafter, the strategy was obvious. Make Montenegro economically dependent of Russia. Russia oligarchs bought the biggest Montenegrin company that produced a large portion of country's export and bought valuable portion of land on the sea coast. With this approach, Russia tried to keep Montenegro in their economic control. As many times prior in history and prevent Montenegro for, uh, from joining NATO. What would be the Russian strategy for Western Balkan today? Russian strategy today is to keep Balkan unstable, to destabilize Europe, to prevent NATO enlargement, and to undermine confidence in Western values. Only in that case could Russia be a pole of power on equal global footing with the United States balancing its power. Russia began its efforts to balance NATO on the ground in uh, 2009 after the summit <coughs> in Moscow, which President Obama refused the, to accept Russia as a great power, but only as a regional one. In early years after the Cold War, Russia was too weak to pursue the balance in the US and NATO. Yet it was able to pursue balancing after after modernizing Russian military and instilling willingness to use military force as well as sophisticated method of hybrid warfare, warfare such as cyber attacks, psychological information, information warfare, propaganda, and economic pressure in achieving its goals. In the terms of this balance of power axiom, Russia's strategic mind, minds looks at the Balkans as just one of many battlefields around the globe. Russia seeks to divide the region into sphere of privilege and interest, Eastern and Western, on a number of grounds, religious, cult cultural, hist history, etc. As you know, Croatia has already become a member of NATO, so <coughs> the ideal place for Russian reaction was Serbia. There are two main reasons. First, the cultural, historical, and religious meet about Russia and experience Serbia with, with NATO in 1999. Second, Serbia as a community are very strong and spread over the Western Balkan. This gives Russia an opportunity to control more countries, for example, Bosnia and Herzegovina through Republic Srpska. Serbia serves as a main asset of Russian politics in the region through Orthodox Church, other cultural institutions, the Serbian Academy of Science, as well as poets, writers, etc. Through the activities and connection of the, of the Orthodox Church, Russia has a convenient way of expanding its influence. The Serbian Orthodox Church is most influential in the region and has got a uh, relation not just the Orthodox, uh, uh, Russian Orthodox Church, but also with some Russian political elites. Despite, despite its undisputed influence and open sympathies in some parts of Balkans, Russia decided that for a long-term presence is in the region is necessary to start forming pro-Russian media, non-government organization, political parties, websites, etc. According to study of the Center of uh, Euro-Atlantic Studies in Belgrade, there is a list of 104 pro-Russian organizations which are active in the Balkans. According to data from European Union, Russia every year spent $1.4 billion on disinformation. One of many confirmation of Russian politics and balancing with US and NATO in Balkans is Russian humanitarian center in the south of Serbia, which is very close to Bon Steel, the main base of US Army under K4 command in Kosovo. The Russian ambassador in Serbia will, be, will likely be Mr. Hershchenko, career diplomat who previously served as a special representative of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs <coughs> for the Balkan and had a special role in Bosnia. Appointment of Mr. Hrchenko 
means that Russia will give priority to this region. Now we are coming to Montenegro case. By September 2015, Russian official position was the choice of Montenegro is a sovereign choice that Russia Federation will respect, said Ambassador Grisa at the reception with the Prime Minister Djukanovic. A few months before the NATO ministerial in December 2015, when it had become, become, become apparent that Montenegro would, be, would get NATO invitation, opposition protests were held in the street of Podgorica. During the protests, banners appeared stating, never in NATO, military neutrality of Montenegro. This neutrality is just another name for closer cooperation with Russia. Neutrality and non-allied are similar words in Montenegro lang language that reference socialist Yugoslavia and Tito. By the end of 2015, protests became violent. The aim of this protest was to launch a public anti-NATO and anti-government campaign on the street with the ambition of blocking NATO access or to deteriorate the process. The intention was to show the West that Montenegro does, does not want to join NATO. Proof of that came very soon, in December 2015. In November 2015, the Russian Duma issued an appeal to Montenegro Parliament stating that involving states, especially against the will of their people in military alliance, are political tools from the Cold War era. In statement, the Duma <coughs> added that the desire of the regime of Montenegro to join contradicts the will of the overwhelming majority of the people in this country. Things good wo got worse in October 2016 during the parliamentary election campaign in Montenegro. In that atmosphere, the final stage was to make trouble in the street of Podgorica. One of the versions was that plotters planned to hide amongst a crowd of pro-opposition supporters protest protesting outside the Montenegrin parliament in capital Podgorica, and then went into the parliament, disguised as policemen, and opened fire the protesters, making it look as though the government had attacked its own people. During the voting day, several Montenegrin online media websites were subjected to mo uh, cyber attack which result is the in temporary disruption of this service. Montenegrin prosecution authorities identify nationalist Serbian and Russian structures as organizers of this act, and two Russian agents uh, as a ringle leaders of the operation. Edward Shirokov is the same name, is the same person who was identified as a member of Russian military intelligence service, GRU, who was declared persona non grata by Polish government after discovering his involvement in intelligence activities. Sky News correspondent and my good friend, Mr. Alistair Bankal, in, in his article has described this is the last piece of jinxo of Russian linking to the election day coup plot in Montenegro. There are two trials today in Montenegro one for planning a terrorist, a terrorist attack in Montenegro and another for money laundering used for finance, financing the election campaign of opposition parties. The intention of this action is in Montenegro was to discourage decision makers in NATO and further, uh, to further expand, but also to discourage state from the region Macedonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, and especially Serbia from going on with the Euro-Atlantic integration. And finally, what is the necessary for a full success story uh, from, my, uh, from my view and possible benefits for both sides, NATO and Montenegro? With, with Montenegrin membership, NATO has become bigger and Montenegro became stronger. Montenegro membership represents a major step toward consolidation, political stability, and democracy in the Western Balkan. Podgorica has chosen a path of pragmatism and reality. 
popping for realization its interest in cooperation with 28 most development countries in the world. In the security sense, this membership will discourage all real and potential aspiration to the territory and integrity of Montenegro and allows the current generation of Montenegrins to devote themselves to achieving the standards of citizen of NATO member states. The biggest benefits for Montenegro is the reforms that Montenegro is implementing, which include strengthening its governing structures and democratic institution, as well as bringing its military up to NATO standards. These reforms represent a necessary condition for sustainable <coughs> economic de development. Benefits for NATO include the experience that Montenegro has with Russia, Montenegro is one of the few countries that can perceive Russia behavior in a different situation. Knowledge learned on its own experience is most valuable uh, knowledge. With this experience, Montenegro could be a bridge between Ru NATO and Russia. Common benefits, NATO and Montenegro, that's an idea, could be establishing NATO Excellence Center in Montenegro. An education center for training pilot of helicopters would contribute capacity to the NATO alliance and demonstrate the presence and power of NATO in the region. This center could be accomplished through joint inv uh, investments of Croatia, Albania, and Montenegro as NATO members, but also countries that are not in NATO, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, and Macedonia. For a full success story, Montenegro membership in NATO should bring a bigger influx of foreign investments primarily for the Western countries. One such direct investment from NATO side country will open a window for other investments and promote Montenegro as a secure investment destination. More like this, create condition for new jobs and will stimulate economic growth. Also, investor <coughs> investments could be decisive, this investment could be decisive factor and motivate others, such as Macedonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Serbia, to recognize necessary and crucial strides for membership in NATO. At the end of this observation, I have to point that a, str for, for, uh, a stronger presence of the United States in the Balkan is a crucial for democratization and further development of the whole country. Only that synergistic efforts of U.S. and the EU can lead to progress this region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nebojša. Tom, <clears throat> it's been... Um, if I count correctly, almost seven years since you had responsibilities for the Balkans. I'm interested to hear, looking back at them, how do you see the situation and what are the prospects? <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. The, uh, the important thing is not that I'm seven years removed. The important thing is that I'm no longer a U.S. government employee. So <laughs> I will tell you what I really think. <clears throat> the, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, with this panel today, to see so many old friends in the audience <clears throat> and to see representatives of the countries of the Western Balkans. I hope that you feel differently than some of the best U.S. allies who are no longer <laughs> certain whether they are friends of the United States. I hope you know that the United States always will have if not an alliance relationship, at least a, reliant, an, a relationship of strong friendship and productive partnership with every country in the Western Balkans. It's an especially happy day because of the uh, agreement between Athens and Skopje. Uh, you are absolutely right, Dan, that as I look around the room and see Hoyt Yi and Ambassador Charlie Rees, uh, there have been many times we discussed in Athens and Skopje the suggestion Northern Macedonia. It's not the simple formula, it's everything that goes with it. And while it will be painful for some people in both countries to accept it, uh, it's a great day. 
and I hope it leads rapidly to NATO membership for Macedonia and clears an important obstacle to EU membership for Macedonia, Northern Macedonia as well. Oh, that's right, I'm not a US employee. I could call it whatever I want. Um, <clears throat> uh, I don't think there's anyone more eager than I am to see European Union membership for the states of the Western Balkans. But there are millions of people who are more optimistic about it than I am. And I think they are unrealistically optimistic. And so I hate to be negative, but as I promised, I'll tell you what I really think. Uh, I have to apologize. Some of the remarks, the analysis that I'm making today, I know at least one person in the room has heard before, so I apologize to him. But the, uh, uh, I hope it's new and provocative for the rest of you. The greatest issue for the Western Balkan region today is not membership in the European. It's not the relationship with NATO. It is not the competition among Washington and Moscow and Brussels. The crucial issue is whether citizens will demand that their governments fight corruption, allow full transparency in their government's financial dealings, promote an independent judiciary, and permit independent media. These are precisely the topics that many political parties in the world want to avoid. Politicians know that if they can get voters to focus on every issue except the voters' own economic interest, then successful politicians will be free to pursue their own economic interests. It is why leaders in this region, and we're here in Washington, not only in this region, prefer to talk about nationalism, about external threats, about ethnic differences, or any other populist theme, rather than about the issues that are defining to democratic societies. Many have become experts in using one democratic element, elections, to create an anti-democratic and opaque economy. Now, the, on economics, the political conditions that get attached to any investment, public or private investment, in most states of these regions are such that I could not, in good conscience, advise any American investor to put money into these states. The political conditions and the lack of rule of law protection for investment are such that I, with my limited funds, certainly will not be investing there. It is, of course, possible to attract investment from Russia and China, but that inevitably means that you are importing at the same time the oligarchy, the enrichment of senior officials that define those two nations' economies. Now, this speaks directly to the region's future. And while I never want to speak ill of any friends in the Balkans, I share the view of many colleagues within the European Union that it was a mistake for the European Union to admit as members Bulgaria and Romania, and arguably Croatia, before the rule of law requirements had been fully met. And today in Southeast Europe, there has been little progress and in some cases regression in both the EU candidates and some current EU members. I think that it's more likely that premature enlargement to the countries of the Western Balkans before they have met those standards would do more to corrode the rule of law throughout the European Union than it would do to elevate the rule of law in the new members. The correct answer for the EU27 is not to lower standards again, but to focus early in the negotiation process in a public manner on actual performance under chapters 23 and 24 of the EU accession pro process as a priority over every other technical aspect 
of the accession process. I'm not happy saying this, but I think it is important for the states of the region to realize that there is no purely political path to EU membership. Some countries have succeeded in the past in gaining EU membership through a purely political path, despite not having fully met the technical requirements. You should make friends with EU members. You should be promoting your candidacy. But your argument is 100 times stronger if you have met the technical requirements, including rule of law, when you try to make those political arguments. <coughs> <clears throat> and rule of law does not include only passing the correct laws. It means actual operation of independent anti-corruption prosecutors, actual operation of independent judiciary, and permission for an independent media to get into the dirt and to reveal what governments are actually doing, which politicians are actually profiting. These are essential to a country that wishes to call itself a democratic member of the European Union. Again, I'm fully aware of the ways in which the United States at the moment is not living up to the ideals that we have traditionally espoused and which I push today. But I do have confidence that we have a history of institutions that will sufficiently retain their independence to bring about a more transparent economy, a more transparent democracy than we have at this moment. I don't yet have the same confidence about the countries of the Western Balkan. And I see regression in a couple of the countries that are currently members of the European Union, including Hungary and Poland. I do want to encourage Montenegro, which by rights should be at the head of the queue. It should be closer to EU membership than the other countries of the Western Balkans. I'm very encouraged by Macedonia, not just because of the name issue, but because of genuine reforms that they have made in just the last couple of years after a fairly dark period. But I'm still concerned about Montenegro in terms of democracy. Congratulations to President Chukanovic for another election victory. It's not healthy for a state to be a single party state for 25 years. It's not healthy for the opposition to be so divided and so incapable of preparing, of uh, displaying a transparent alternative to the governing party that they are never able to get elected. It's not healthy for a democracy that anti-corruption is used primarily as a tool against opponents or former allies, rather than against the people who demonstrably have benefited the most from a non-transparent economy. And it's not promoting of a rule of law to declare media, any media, as enemies of the state, nor does it meet European standards to replace the director of the public broadcasting system when they do something that displeases the government? There are great potentials for all the countries of the Western Balkans to move ahead. And I look forward to their success in doing so. But let me... <clears throat> Just make one thing clear. I'm fascinated by what you describe about Russia. I know very much how much Russia wishes to exert influence and to have other countries in the Balkans imitate their model of a thoroughly corrupt, non-transparent, media-controlling government. 
it's not a smart path for any country into the Balkans, in the Balkans. Putinism with a human face is not a formula for EU membership. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So, Mike, uh, the Bush is worried about the Russian influence. Tom is worried about uh, things internal to the Balkan countries that, that uh, need to be fixed before uh, they can enter at least the EU, if not NATO. Uh, how do you see things? <laughs> so what am I worried about? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Tom and uh, Nebusha. I want to make clear at the outset, uh, the, the same way Tom did, that my views are strictly personal ones, certainly not necessarily those of Johns Hopkins Sice, and certainly not of the U.S. government, that I also served for many years, but no longer do. Um, just a quick word or two about what our speakers uh, said, and I really can't find fault with very much at all. And then I'll go into what sort of uh, remarks that I prepared early this morning sitting here after I had successfully avoided rush hour traffic by coming in early. Uh, Nebuisha, I, I, uh, I share your worries about, about the Russian influence. It would be great if we could live in a world where countries could extol cultural and religious affinities with other countries without having those ties abused. I mean, uh, George and I la and maybe other people in the audience were at the Russian National Day celebration last night, and there were, um, yeah, Obrad was there, I guess, too. Uh, there were several uh, Orthodox priests there, and I, you know, that's, it should be that way, absolutely. I think the problem is when, and, and you know, we all know the history, Nikola Pashic together with Russia were 150 million and all that, and there, you read Anna Karenina and you know the, the justifiably soft spot in the hearts of Serbs for Russia. But I think what uh, Nebojša uh, outlined to us is, is, is all too real, I think, and, and, it, and it goes back to what Tom said about about politicians who put their own interests, um, either their own egos or their financial interests ahead of those of their countries and using weapons of mass distraction, as we say, um, talk about supposed or real external enemies and this is, this is the name of the game. Um, I wouldn't begin to go into the detail that Tom just did or I certainly wouldn't challenge it. The one thing I would say, uh, as a last preface to what I want to talk about, it has to do with the United States. Tom is confident that our institutions will weather the current storm. I guess in, in the last analysis, if you put the gun to my head, I would come down the same way. But I think if we've learned anything from the last 16 or 18 months is that institutions are only as good as the people who staff the institutions. Now, our founding fathers were centuries ahead of their time. I mean, you look at the Constitution, you look at the Federalist Papers, and you have to marvel at how prescient these people were. But of course, the 1790s, we didn't have computers, we didn't have <laughs> social media, we didn't have a lot of things. And I think the result is that uh, there, there are end runs that unscrupulous people can make around the institutions. And if, in fact, the people who staff the institutions don't live up to their constitutional responsibilities, then the institutions won't work. And, I, and I, that is my greatest fear. But let me go on to talk about the Western Balkans a little bit. Uh, I, I share what th my three colleagues have said about the Macedonia name issue. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great step forward. Um, and I do hope that the parliaments, the two parliaments approve. One word of caution, uh, one shouldn't forget about the uh, referendum in Cyprus when it looked like 
at the outset this was going to work, the Annan plan, and then everybody was worried about the Turks saying no, and then <laughs> it turned out we had the wrong, we had the wrong uh, uh, group of people in mind because the Greek Cypriots voted it down. And, and uh, as I understand it, there won't be a referendum in Greece, but nonetheless, uh, people can express their opinions to uh, Parliament, and I certainly hope that that both countries uh, realize that it's in their interest to uh, to accept this. Um, just the tour d'horizon of the Western Western Balkans. Uh, Tom went into great detail about about Montenegro, and I and I share the the uh, the wish that media freedom would would come up to what it should be. Uh, one thing which one should always say positive, positively about Montenegro that I don't think you can say about any other country in the Western Balkans, and that's namely, and, and, and for Americans, it's a big deal, and that is namely it's the only country that has successfully integrated its Albanian minority, its Slavic Muslim minority, um, and that's, that's terrific. I mean, I could give you anecdotes about some of the some of the discussions that I've had over the years, but suffice it to say that that um, uh, that is that is just a huge plus in that part of the world, and I and I and I congratulate the Montenegrins for it. Um, I'm concerned about the recent, I won't say a rise, recrudescence maybe of of ultra nationalism in several of the countries of the Western Balkans. You know, it's 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 kind of a poor man's nationalism. I don't know what to say. I, I'm, I'm worried about Croatia, particularly about the, what I perceive to be a negative role in, that they're playing in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia has elections coming up, and 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 um, one one sees tribalism all over the world. One certainly sees it in the United States, but. Uh, because of Dayton, which was certainly better than fighting, nonetheless, we have institutional tribalism. And I think that, uh, you know, I would hope that some of the politicians that don't fall into that category would do well. Um, Kosovo and Albania have made great strides. I think Albania still needs what the Germans call uh coming to grips with your past in an open, honest way. Uh, there were good things and bad things done on both sides in the, in the war, uh, Serbia and Kosovo, and I just think that uh, you can't move forward if you don't come clean about the past completely. Um, nothing is gonna work in the Balkans without the cooperation of the European Union and the United States of America. I think that's been shown to, to be true. The EU, as usual, has its heart in the right place. But the problem is, that, number one, the EU has never really understood power politics. I get the impression sometimes that they look upon uh, power politics as something that uh, gentlemen don't do. Uh, there are ways that they could have helped the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the last decade if they had used power politics. But secondly, as Tom has alluded to, there's, there's serious internal disputes within the EU, which, are, which I think are really hampering their ability to live up to their own principles and to project those principles elsewhere. And obviously, Hungary and Poland are the most obvious examples. But I mean, the new government in Italy in the last few days hasn't exactly distinguished itself either. And then we have Brexit. What's changed? And, and of course, what's changed since, let's say, since the Bosnian Wars, obviously uh, there's more input from Russia, there's a whole lot more input uh, from, uh, from Turkey, and a whole, whole lot more input from China. That's changed, but I would submit, sadly, that what's changed is the wild card is the United States of America. I think for the first time since 1945, we have a president who rejects a leading international role for the United States. And you all know what I'm talking about, withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which of course 
had it been adopted, would have obviated the need to rant and rave about uh, Canadian milk tariffs. That's just one example. The Paris Climate uh, Accord. You know, whatever you think of it, and I think a lot of it, you have to just step back and say, wait a minute, 194 countries agree to this and one doesn't? Is it possible that the one is right and the 194 are wrong? I, I don't think so, at least not very likely. And of course, the Iran nuclear deal, which had stringent inspection a stringent in, in, inspection regime that we could only dream about for North Korea. Um, I mean, the hypocrisy is just monumental. We have a president who doesn't value allies, who called NATO obsolete, changed his mind, at least on paper, we'll see, uh, who seemed to think, seems to think Article 5 is like a protection racket completely misunderstands the 2% of GDP guidelines. He thinks it's paying into NATO somehow. Uh, somebody might have pointed out that 29 members times 2% of each would only come out to 58%. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous. It, it it's, has nothing to do with, with, the, with the NATO budget. And we have a situation where when the off summit became the on summit again, uh, our staunch allies in South Korea, who contribute a whole lot more than 2%, uh, weren't even informed. They had to learn about it from the, the news media. And um, a day and a half ago, in the press conference, when the president declared that all of a sudden we weren't going to have the uh, joint military maneuvers with South Korea anymore, that was news to the South Koreans. I mean, this is, this is a matter of life and death for these people, and calling it provocative. It's provocative, I guess, if you're North Korean, but if you're anybody else, it's kept the peace for 60 years. And then there was the G7 fiasco in Quebec, like a preteen temper tantrum. Uh, clearly, we have a president who feels much more at home with dictators and would-be autocrats, Putin, Xi Jinping, Kim Jong-un, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Rodrigo Duterte, you name it. Then with Angela Merkel or Emmanuel Macron or Theresa May or Justin Trudeau, it's really hard for an American to look at that and just not be, once the amazement fades, the nausea sets in. But let's look at what it would mean for the Balkans. And here I'm going to go into some pessimistic scenarios. Uh, we have foreign policy by presidential whim and tweet. Uh, I just mentioned the South Korea military exercises. And incidentally, I'm not going to put words in, in I'm not going to necessarily ascribe motives to people in this room, but I can well imagine if I were a US diplomat and I saw that my country's foreign policy was essentially disregarding the recommendations of the professional foreign service and was being decided that, you know, the last person that the president talked to or whatever, or, or, or his political base, uh, you know, I think seriously about retiring. And I think there have been a lot of retirements in the foreign service of absolutely irreplaceable people that can be directly traced to that. Look, I think we have earned street credibility in the Balkans. And I, it's no secret. We have a lot more credibility than the EU does, and we've deserved it. We made some mistakes, but I think if you look at the last 25 years, uh, without the United States of America, there'd still be fighting and mass murder and worse. Um, we don't want to squander that. Uh, we have highly knowledgeable Balkan experts, some of them in this room right now. In a normal administration, their recommendations would be passed up the State Department's chain of command, and then it would go to interagency and the process, according to the National Security Act of 1947, cul culminates in the National Security Council, where the National Security Advisor coordinates and recommends policy to the president. Here, I have to put a personal note in. I'll probably get in real trouble, but we, but we have a uh, uh, 
we have a person as deputy national security advisor who, who is really one of the most knowledgeable people in this town about the Balkans. And so that gives me some hope. I'm talking about Mira Ricardell. Um, but let's, let's just make the most, uh, let's make the not unreasonable assumption that our Bar Balkan policy left to the professionals is sensible and doable. I mean, I think that's a fairly reasonable thing. But then what? Well, maybe the president will use his infallible, infallible ability to size up someone in one minute and decide that one of the Balkan anti-democratic bad guys uh, who have flattered him, perhaps, is honorable, and he should, we should side with them. Or perhaps he'll look at, uh, you know, motorcycle gangs and be enamored of the fact that they're tough, the same way he thought that there were some very fine people among the neo-Nazis who invaded Charlottesville, Virginia last August. I don't think that's unreasonable. I think it's a possibility. Or that the malign Russian influence in the Balkans that uh, Nebuysha, uh so clearly delineated shouldn't be countered because, I don't know, maybe there'd be too many jobs lost at Gazprom. I'm not sure. Uh, President Trump thinks unpredictability is a strategy. It's not. It's a tactic, and it's not even a very good tactic because it pretty soon becomes counterproductive. Somebody mentioned bond steel. I guess Tom did. You know, what if we find out that to save a few dollars, we'll close bond steel when after we've essentially broken the budget with a <laughs> $1.3 trillion tax cut followed by a profligate omnibus um, appropriations bill at about the same amount. It's pocket change, but you can make the case that, you know, you can save money by doing, you know, cutting out anything. Or on top of that, my worst nightmare, and I have to say this, I mean, I'm a NATO guy, if nothing else, and, and, and I, I, tapes, I take, uh, I guess, some of the criticism that I'm not an EU guy, but I'm a NATO guy, and I did push for Bulgaria and Romania to come into NATO, the same way I pushed for Croatia and Albania. Um, and I think it was the right thing to do, but I mean, I'm worried. My absolute nightmare is next month's uh, summit in Brussels, the NATO summit. I mean, suppose the president decides to throw a, you know, a hissy fit like the G7 in uh, Quebec. It's not impossible. I think it's unlikely. What are the chances of all this happening? Certainly under 50-50, uh, perhaps a good deal under 50-50, but still, well within the realm of probability or possibility, something that I don't think, I certainly never would have said even, a, said even a year ago. So what's my bottom line? I mean, I agree with Tom. Our Balkan friends should have faith and trust the United States of America that we'll come out of this. I think we will. But a lot of damage can be done before that. And... Um, you know, sometimes um, if we're not going to lead, if we're going to follow a policy of retrenchment around the world, then I guess our friends and allies should take up the slack, be the adults in the room. I have confidence in our allies. I have confidence in our friends who are not our allies yet. Um, and I would urge them to take the long view to, you know, sort of act like the Americans have for the last 70 years. <laughs> With that happy note, I'm going to stop, and, uh, and I'm sure there'll be questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mike. We've had three quite uh, remarkably complementary, maybe sometimes contradictory uh, perspectives on what ails the Balkans. Uh, Nabojsha pointing at the Russians, Tom pointing at the systems within the Balkan countries, and Mike uh, pointing at uh, finger pretty clearly at the EU and at the US. Uh, I hasten to add, I think all of this doom and gloom is well justified. <laughs> but I want to I wanna add just a note of optimism. Uh, when I travel in the Balkans, people all tell me things were better under Tito. Things were not better <laughs> under Tito. Uh, the Balkans have progressed enormously 
in the years since the wars of the 1990s. And one of the reasons they've progressed reasonably well is that we had people like Tom and Nebusha and Mike pointing to the clouds on the horizon, warning us of the storms to come, and trying to find ways past the problems that arose. And uh, my compliments in particular are directed at Hoyt Yi, who uh, uh, spent his years in charge of the Balkans at the State Department, uh, really uh, resolving some of those problems that all of us pointed at. And uh, my compliments to him. And I, I, I think we, we still have in the State Department people who are capable of hearing these, uh, these they're not criticisms, they're warnings, uh, and trying to find ways around them. But with that, I'll open the floor to uh, questions. And, uh, Obrit, uh, please stand up. Use the microphone. Introduce yourself. Uh, Obrad Kasich. I'm the director of the office of the Republika Srpska for the Cooperation, Trade, and Investment here in D.C. Uh, my question, I want to broaden the discussion if I can. Uh, everybody seemed to concentrate on the trees and not the forest. And what do I mean by that? Uh, I think what we're seeing is a reaction against globalism. Uh, at least the political element or the ideology, uh, ideology, the political ideology of globalism. So this goes beyond kind of the um, descriptions we've had of the current situation in the Balkans. And it's a much uh, deeper rooted problem if you approach it from that perspective than looking at individually the problems within the countries or the problem in Washington. Uh, I think I would like to hear from you how you see, after a four-year period uh, of this administration, how is, what is the potential to go back to the political ideology that was the foundation of U.S. foreign policy in the Baltics, uh, in the Balkans, excuse me, for the last several decades? Let me take one other at the same time, uh, Ed. Thank you very much, Edward Joseph, colleague here at size and uh, I want to follow on Obrad's question just to say that precisely because of this uh, populism did you call it Obrad or reaction anti anti-globalization that you call it this is what makes the news yesterday so remarkable because the driver behind the uh, certainly from the Macedonian perspective the the driver was precisely to join the EU so this is why it was such a remarkable breakthrough that uh, these two countries came together. And I think the other point we should mention, Dan, here uh, quickly is the, if I, you were right, it was not about the substance. In the end, it was political courage. This is what it was, and it didn't take Hoi Yi this time. Thankfully, it did not take Hoi Yi to, uh, there was no doubt there was help, but uh, it was really, this initiative uh, came, uh, began in Athens and was well reciprocated in Skopje by uh, Prime Minister Zayev. And I think that's the real takeaway here. And we have to acknowledge and support, give them the support, because they will face enormous opposition. Um, my question is for Tom Countryman. Uh, Tom, uh, everyone probably agrees that uh, corruption, rule of law are huge issues. What I'm puzzled about is why you seem to be skeptical about the European Union accession process, precisely because, again, as we just saw yesterday, it's been such a motivator for reform. <clears throat> Croatia was a great example. They arrested their prime minister. The ruling government, the Hadeze government, arrested its prime minister, Ivo Sanader, uh, in large part as a demonstration of rule of law, not as a vengeful act by the uh, uh, different party. And, uh, so, and we see yesterday, this is the, the motivator. So I'm a little puzzled by why you see a trend to lowering standards. I don't see a trend. Croatia had to meet higher standards after uh, the Bulgarian-Romania fiasco. So thank you very much. Tom, you want to start with that one? Sure. <clears throat> Lots of things to say. First, let me pile on on saying good things about Hoyt Yi. 
the agreement between uh, Greece and North Macedonia, uh, as I said, has been long in gestation, and uh, Hoyt had a major role in getting us to where we are, and another great uh, Balkan specialist, Matt Palmer, who's uh, taken Hoyt's place, uh, brought it to the finish line, but it was, I know who deserves the credit. Hoyt spent four years in that Deputy Assistant Secretary position overseeing the Balkan policy, uh, which is double the usual time. He, I don't know why the judge showed no mercy in his sentence. Uh, he's one of several, several recidivists in this room who keep going back to the Balkans, including Ed Joseph and Rod Moore and Bob Hant, but you uh, deserve great credit with many others on this. Obrad's question, you know, on the one hand, yeah, globalism is an issue, and people's reaction to global trends, whether they are sitting in Ohio or in Bihach, is an issue. But saying globalism is the problem is kind of like saying Japan has a problem with earthquakes. It's true, you can't stop the earthquakes you can have a grown-up response to them. You could be prepared for the next one. Or you can monger in fear. Uh, and that is, unfortunately, the attitude that too many politicians in Bosnia, in Italy, in the United States have taken. Globalism is a fact, and it's a fact of technological change that will not be reversed. The question is, do we have responsible leadership or do we have ego-driven, self-aggrandizing leadership who exploit the fears of ordinary people, as has happened repeatedly in the Balkans since the breakup of Yugoslavia? Um, would U.S. policy return to before? Uh, yes. I don't think that U.S. policy in the Balkans has changed dramatically in the last 18 months. Uh, you're right, Mike, that the U.S. ought to pay some attention to issues in the Balkans. On the other hand, you ought to be grateful that you are generally below <laughs> the White House radar. That's not a bad place to be. Um, but it can go back, I hope, to a more activist policy that reinforces EU approach in two ways. One, it reinforces the EU backbone in insisting on meaningful reform as a condition for membership. And two, it reinforces the credibility of the EU as a magnet for forcing those reforms. Uh, and that leads to Ed's question, why am I somewhat skeptical uh, that the EU will lower standards? Um, it's a very hard line for the European Union to walk on any issue. Any issue that requires consensus of 27 is difficult. Uh, it becomes more difficult when there are a couple of members who are regressing in an authoritarian direction, as is happening now within the EU. Uh, it is very clear that there are some strong advocates of Western Balkan integration into the EU, including Bulgaria and others, uh, and they sincerely believe it's in their security interest to do so, and I respect that. There are just as clearly several members of the EU who have made clear uh, the point of view that I think is similar to mine. Uh, it's premature to take countries in if they are only going to lower the standards <clears throat> for the rest of the EU and encourage others to follow the example of Poland and Hungary in regressing to non-democratic behavior. To walk that fine line, to remain a beacon of hope for the states of the Western Balkans, to give them an incentive to make these reforms, but to be realistic about the process is extraordinarily difficult for the EU to get right, especially when they have 28 foreign ministers 
of the European Union, each with a slightly different opinion. I don't blame Western Balkan states for being frustrated at the signals they get from the EU. I don't blame them for thinking that Brussels moves the goalposts. Uh, but the business of diplomacy is removing excuses that the other guy has. And the right approach for the states of the Western Balkans is to remove these various excuses that somebody in Paris or Brussels or Madrid may have by being such an obviously shining candidate for EU membership that nobody can argue. None of the states of the Western Balkans is so shiny yet. Mike. <clears throat> Just to back up what Tom said about uh, anti-globalization, uh, look, whenever there's economic change, there are going to be winners and losers. That's obvious. So some losers have justifiable gripes, wherever it is, the United States or Serbia or anywhere. But as Tom said, the question is, how do politicians handle this? And I mentioned the, you know, the catchphrase, weapons of mass distraction. I mean, this is basically what's going on. Instead of trying to expend energy to retrain people and maybe redirect the, their, their possibilities career-wise, there, there's fear-mongering and people's feelings are manipulated and exaggerated, and, and I think that's, that's the problem. But again, there are gonna be losers. That's creative destruction and capitalism. Not much you can do about it. I would venture to say, though, that there'd be very few people in the Western Balkans who'd complain if there'd be a huge investment from country X or country Y. That's globalization, but if, if it gave them a job, they'd be plenty happy for it in most cases. Um, with regard to the EU, actually, I think Ed's example of Sonata was very good. I mean, it, it, it may be the exception that proves the rule. I'm not sure, but you have to give Croatia credit for that. Um, my problem with the EU, though, is, is that it's all carrots and no sticks. <laughs> I mean, uh, carrots work to us to a certain point, uh, but the carrots look less uh, appealing as the ideals, what the Europeans love, the EU like to call European values, get eroded at the core. And there are times, as I mentioned in my commentary, and I was thinking mainly about Bosnia, where the EU could have and should have used a little bit of muscle. Um, you know, if the, we still, the EU still has a few hundred, I think most of them Austrian peacekeepers, uh, in EU4, uh, should never have been allowed to atrophy, and it could have been, you, there are ways that they could have been redeployed within the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina that would have pretty quickly been clear would be a hindrance to any, any, any dreams of secession. That's just one example. Uh, the EU is a great place, their ideals are fine, uh, and I couldn't agree more with Tom that the, the big task for Balkan countries is to, as we say, tend to their own knitting. I mean, just be better democracies. If you're better democracies, I have no doubt that membership will follow. Nabusha, you guys have asked two good questions, obviously. I will share my experience about EU integration of Montenegro. That's, we worked very hard on these docu documents that we have to uh, to done, but when I was in government that uh, years for Montenegro for entering in EU was to, uh, 2021, now is 2025. So I am not sure that it will be 2025. It's uh, sometimes I think that EU can it doesn't have a unique strategy for this region. Sometimes... You're right. But at the uh, same time, is, uh, uh, on your uh, comment on your speech, is uh, that EU Commission should not forget the correct role of Montenegro all these years. Because all, all that years of turmoil was peaceful and uh, 
harmonic and multi-ethnic harmony in Montenegro. So now I think that Montenegro deserve more, more, more support than ever from EU Commission. And we cannot forget that Montenegro accepted migrants from all sides in Yugoslav war. It's one moment what was 25% of population, of all population migrants was 25% of all population in Montenegro. So that's, that's a huge things, huge achievements of Montenegro. And of course, I have to say something about uh, uh, a referendum for independence. That, that was, uh, that was 55% for, for independence. I can't remember any other example with similar conditions. So that's all achievements of of Montenegro. I, I think government work on um, very hard on, on these documents for EU, and I think that uh, Montenegro today deserve more support than ever. Let me add a word about Montenegro, because I think uh, there's some misunderstanding about Montenegro. I'm not going to take time to ask about it. The truth of the matter is that Montenegro has pretty free press, and none of it is very supportive of Djukanovic. I've talked to Djukanovic about his big problem, and I agree with you, Tom, that the big problem is the lack of an opposition that can govern. But you know, that's where the Russians are so clever, because by supporting the anti-Djukanovic opposition. They are preventing a viable governing force from emerging. He needs an opposition that can come to power and govern with EU membership still as the goal. And that can't be done by this Russian-supported opposition. So uh, while I don't believe that Montenegro will get much credit for past performance, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, I do think we need to be careful to analyze what's going on now and realize that the Russian influence is a powerful inhibitor of, of democratic, the democratic trajectory for Montenegro. It could become that also for Macedonia. I expect the Russians to work hard against approval of the agreement in the, in the Greek parliament and in the Macedonian parliament, but probably have more success in the Greek parliament. So I think we shouldn't, uh, I want to bring it back to Nobosha's concern with the Russians, because I think we shouldn't lose track of that. That is a new element in the Balkans, uh, or if it's not exactly new, it's much amplified from the past, and we have to begin to figure out ways to deal with it. Let me take two more questions, Mr. Ambassador. And one back there. Thank you. Then I will stand here that I don't turn my back to the audience. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you for the panel for this excellent, excellent discussion. And uh, I would like to join all of you in congratulating uh, Macedonia and Greece for reaching the <coughs> agreement on the name issue and uh, congratulating my good friend Hoiti for this award, which he will get later. And I cannot tell, uh, uh, in, I cannot have enough words to appreciate his uh, professionalism and friendship while we were working together these years uh, when I came as ambassador here to, to the US. Uh, as I said, I don't have questions, but uh, just to set the record straight, a few comments about uh, what you have said. Uh, as far as Nebosha is concerned, maybe I am the last person you would expect to defend Russia, or, or uh, and I'm not trying to do that, but. Uh, I don't think that Russia is, in the case of Serbia at least, is not that much against our EU integration. Against NATO, yes, but EU integration, or the official policies at least, that they are supporting our EU integration. So I think that's, that's at least a good thing. Although I don't deny that there are some negative elements and negative influence in the media or think tanks and otherwise in Serbia as far as Russia. But, but the overall official policy is that EU integration of Serbia is supported by them. And we have 
quite good relations with them. I, I agree with that, that they have their own interest and they are looking to their interest and there is no uh, Slavic brotherhood as somebody would say and that, that's why we, uh, although in the hearts of the Serbs, uh, Russia is very close, but when you ask them where would you li like to live and uh, your children to study, 99% would say in the, in the West. The other thing which you mentioned regarding the uh, humanitarian center, so-called humanitarian center, it's uh, really a humanitarian center because there is nothing what could uh, endanger either one still or something else. It's not not a, not a military base, and uh, despite some fears, they have not uh, got the uh, status of uh, or, or the diplomatic status. So that still there are. Uh, three people, five people, and two dogs there. So that's, that's the situation now, and they are reacting to these, uh, these uh, things which are uh, uh, more and more happening, these uh, catastrophic floods or droughts, so that, that's their role. And, and uh, Prime Minister and now President Vucic has promised that they will not get the diplomatic status, they, they didn't. And, and the third thing, uh, when you mentioned the coup in Montenegro, uh, yes, I agree that there were some Serbian and uh, Russian nationalists uh, there, but uh, we would, uh, I, I would like to mention the very positive role the Serbian government played in, in uh, yes. foiling that, that, yes, uh, that coup. So that, that's, I, I would just for the record say that. As far as Tom's, uh, Tom's mm -hmm. remarks said, I agree absolutely that uh, we have to, to do more work, especially fighting corruption. Uh, in uh, reform of judiciary, uh, rule of law, and all the, all these things, uh, freedom of media. Yes, although uh, you know in Serbia that there is a mixed picture. Most of the media uh, are against Vucic, and they are saying something against the government and that's and But uh, there are few, of course, which are pro-government. But uh, the freedom of media is one of the areas which we should address. Uh, and uh, when you mentioned the investment that you are fearing for the conditions of investment, and you would not. Uh, not bet your money on, on that. Uh, I would like to just say that there are so many good examples of investment in Serbia. Just to mention a few NCR, uh, Cooper Tires, uh, Ball Packaging, Coca-Cola, Microsoft. So they are there and they have a good experience with, with the investments. So they, they don't have any, any problems. And I think they are good examples for other investors to come to Serbia. And uh, the conditions are, are all there. And uh, just one word to, to Mike's comments. Uh, absolutely compliments to Montenegro for integrating the minorities and, and uh, having achieved that. But I think uh, Serbia has also been mentioned as a good example. I myself, I, am, I, am, I don't want to promote that, and, and I'm not telling it, but I am willingly or not willingly a, a member of the Hungarian minority. They have all rights in Serbia. I, as a Hungarian minority, member of the Hungarian minority, was foreign policy advisor to the prime minister and now ambassador of Serbia. I don't think there is any, any better example of the integration of the minority than myself uh, in, in the system. And not to mention that all these minorities have their own TV stations, own uh, media, newspapers, and radio stations. And, and they can, in the court, they can use their own language uh, with the interpreter officially, uh, official advice to them. So thank you very much for thank that. You, thank you, Mr. Abbas. I have one more question in the back, and then we'll proceed to other things. Hi, my name is Arsim, I'm from Baltimore, and uh, first I will congratulate Montenegro because it's not so bad situation there. They have a highest income in region, and they didn't do crazy privatization. That will be enough for that. Second, I think most important is like uh, Serbia is big problem there because in Serbian op public opinion, it's not ready to admit mistakes of 90s. And without that, you can't make any progress. And last, I will be more optimistic. Tomorrow, I'll start, start the World Cup in soccer. When it comes to the soccer, it looks like a NAFTA is working. And World Cup in 2026 will be held in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Thank you. Uh, anybody want to comment? I think uh, maybe we're at the point we will wrap up. <clears throat> and uh, I think I turned the microphone a quick comment. You have a quick <clears throat> comment, Tom? Um, Please. Just on freedom of the press, I agree with you, Dan, that it is not as dire a situation in Montenegro as it is in some other places. I can't agree, Mr. Ambassador, that the majority of the media in Serbia is critical of the Vucic go government. 
particularly when you look at television. Now, I don't watch Serbian TV every day. I haven't been in Serbia since last October. Maybe it's changed. But the fact is that the Serbian government has used half of the same tactics that Mr. Putin uses to control television and to avoid criticism of the government on television, which is where you put the state advertising dollar and who gets the licenses and who gets intimidated. Thank God the Serbian government has not employed the other half of the Putin tactic, which is to assassinate journalists who are overly critical. Thank God. Uh, but it is, n there are no, there are many independent media voices that are critical of the Vucic government. Uh, they are not big and they are not able to enjoy the same level of state support that the cheering section media that dominates television is able to do. Otherwise, I won't disagree with your other comments. I, I'm going to cut off what I think would be a fascinating debate. Uh, <laughs> But I'm going to cut it off only temporarily and say that I, I think we could use a discussion of media, maybe not only in Serbia, but throughout the Balkans. Because I think media, as Tom, you pointed out, media and the independent judiciary are, are really two of the most important missing element, elements in constructing liberal democracy in the Balkans. And I think, I think we need to revisit those questions uh, in, in some depth. Dan Hamilton, I saw you come in. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, first of all, let me uh, thank the panelists. Uh, maybe we should all uh, thank them. So. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, our series on the Western Balkans continues uh, with the con conflict management program at SICE, and, and Dan is doing a lot, and I think you're doing something soon again on that, in fact, next week, as I recall. Uh, so we'll keep you apprised of that if you'd like to stay uh, tuned. But as I had said, this is part of a larger initiative that we have uh, ongoing for a number of years on the Mediterranean Basin, looking at all the interactions that are happening uh, in that world. And we have uh, established a tradition of honoring uh, people who really contribute to greater and deeper understanding of that dynamic. Uh, we've honored senators and CEOs and all sorts of people, uh, but today it's a, it's a personal pleasure to recognize Hoyt Yi, uh, who uh, in his time in the State Department, I, I would say my way of characterizing Hoyt's role has been, he's been an honest friend uh, to the Western Balkans. Uh, and I say that with some consideration. He's not a broker. Diplomats sometimes, you know, they're supposed to be brokers. They're supposed to man maneuver and mediate. But Toyd, I think, has shown to his colleagues in the region, he's really been a friend of the region, not only uh, there, but also here in Washington. Important to have friends in Washington, uh, in the State Department. But he's also been uh, honest. And I think that's won him uh, great respect. Uh, across the region, across Europe, across uh, this, the Washington community, um, for saying, being a straight shooter, saying sometimes what has to be said. And uh, often that's not easy. But I think that is what wa has won him um, influence and also uh, people listen to him. Um, and that's also not easy. Uh, and it wasn't just through his role in the Balkans, but I think as people know, Hoyt has had many different roles in the State Department. Uh, we knew each other in, in RPM, I think, right? Doing, we were enlarging the alliance at the time. Um, and he went on to Brussels to work uh, for the Secretary General. Uh, but he's had a, a broad range of experience, um, and, uh, and I think everyone knows that. 
So what I'd like to do here is uh, not only invite Hoyt up, but I want to, my colleague Dan in particular, and Mike Haltz, my other colleague, and Sasha, you've been so part of this. Uh, Sasha's been with us, and Ed is another fellow. We're sort of the institutional representation here. I'd just like you to come up and join me as we present this award to Hoyt. I think we're known as the Sice Mafia. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> that can get you into trouble. <laughs> I'm going to actually give this to you unopened so that you can open it. It's like a birthday <laughs> present. <laughs> oh, Very nice. Hard to get out. <laughs> so uh, let me read it, though, to you. So uh, the Center for Transatlantic Relations at SICE presents the Mediterranean Leadership Award to Hoyt Brian Yee, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State from the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs for his outstanding achievements in promoting democracy and human rights in countries of Central and South Central Europe, uh, presented this day in Washington. Hoyt, right, congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Uh, Dan and uh, Dan and uh, Joseph and uh, Sasha, Mike and uh, the panelists, uh, Mr. Todorovic and uh, and Tom Countryman. I um, and 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 Dan in particular. I want to thank you for those kind words. Um, uh, normally, one hears such accolades only after meeting an un untimely demise. Um, I certainly hope you don't know something that I don't. Uh, it's really an honor. And I am only going to say um, a few words of thanks because I, I, I still am employed, unlike Tom, by the, the State Department. So I, I can't say exactly what uh, I might if, um, if in my former role or if um, uh, after leaving the State Department. Um, a few groups that I, I wanted to thank. And, and <laughs> Dan, you reminded me of uh, at the beginning when you introduced this, uh, this session of um, a very um, interesting peculiarity about the State Department and um, a group of diplomats uh, and former diplomats uh, in the State Department and Washington community of um, people who follow the Balkans, in fact, people who will not let go of the Balkans. And it, uh, it reminds me of something that uh, a former mentor told me, a U.S. diplomat who served m multiple tours in the Balkans. He's not in the room, so I can say this. Um, and it was when I began my first tour in the Balkans and he took me aside and said, uh, Hoyt, I, I want you to understand that, uh, uh, you know, there's something special about the Balkans. And um, working in the Balkans as an American diplomat is a special track. So you should know that um, working in the Balkans as an American diplomat starts off as a kind of a hobby. But then it, 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 it transforms into an addiction. And, and eventually it ends up as a disease. <laughs> so, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I think what you, you see before you, with Nebojša's exception, a, a group of hardcore addicts, um, Balkan addicts. And um, the question that many of you might have is why? And uh, we can't really get into that for the reasons we've mentioned, maybe another discussion um, off the record. But there is something irresistible about the region, um, something irresistible about the people um, from the Western Balkans, the culture, the, the food, the, the, the wine. Um, but I think within the State Department, uh, and I can speak for, for my generation and uh, perhaps for, for earlier generations of uh, U.S. diplomats who believe strongly in the potential for the Western Balkans uh, to be um, together with the family of European democracies um, the family of transatlantic democracies in the European Union, in NATO, um, our belief that the people of the Western Balkans um, deserve to be there, deserve um, a better future. And that drives a lot of us, um, Balkan hands, to continue working on what sometimes seems to other colleagues of ours to be impossible or to be futile. And uh, I think that's going to continue. I think that uh, there are younger generations of diplomats in the State Department, but also I think uh, 
in civil society, in the think tanks around Washington, in uh, the uh, universities, and of course uh, in Europe, all throughout Europe, there are uh, a lot of people who still believe in the Western Balkans, uh, despite all the problems that have been, been mentioned here. Um, but uh, now I want to segue into to thank yous. Um, the, 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 the real obligation, um, the, the, the responsibility, of course, for all of this uh, progress towards democracy and um, integration belongs with the, the real experts. Um, and I'm so pleased to see uh, several ambassadors from the region here today. Um, you are the real experts. And of course, of course, you're the people who really understand the region. Um, all we can do, as, as, as Dan mentioned, is to be, uh, to be friends, uh, sometimes brokers, but really to be friends, to tell you um, not necessarily what you might want to hear, but what we believe you need to hear. And uh, it's a partnership, so there's obligations on both ends. And I think, uh, you know, again, without speaking for uh, the, the State Department officially, I think you can always count on the United States being that partner. So um, the first group I do want to thank is uh, all of my, my friends and partners from the Western Balkans who have been patient and intolerant and indulgent uh, with, with me and my colleagues for, for so many years. And I hope you'll continue being this, this way. Um, and uh, to thank you for what I know you're going to do in the future as, as diplomats, representatives, ministers, uh, leaders uh, in, your, in your countries. It's extremely important. Um, I, of course, need to um, thank uh, uh, the Dans and uh, Saiz and uh, um, Sasha Toparic and uh, Mike Holtzel for um, being uh, that group of uh, Balkan hands that never wants to let go and embraces others who are interested in this part of the world, not only that part of the world, wider, of course. It's important that there is a core um, that is uh, not inside necessarily the, the, the government, um, able to take stands and to say things that uh, you know, only someone like Tom Countryman could say, um, but from the standpoint of real expertise and of uh, genuinely good intentions. And I appreciate very much uh, all that uh, you've done and you continue to do. Um, I would be very remiss if I didn't thank uh, my colleagues uh, within the State Department and the wider Washington interagencies we sell, say, both <laughs> past, um, and I see former bosses, uh, colleagues, um, uh, mentors in the audience uh, all around me, who, um, without whom I would not never been able to uh, um, achieve anything. Uh, so um, to the former ambassadors who are here, to my colleagues in the South Central Europe and Central Europe offices in the State Department, my colleagues in the European Union, my colleagues in Europe who uh, have been great partners, um, and many of you, I think probably all of you in some way, uh, have been um, uh, together with me or my uh, partners, my colleagues, in some kind of scheme, some kind of conspiracy that we've been working on together, in a positive sense, I mean, of course. Um, thank you for the support and uh, for continuing, which is what is uh, the, the most important part, I think, of uh, this today's exercise. And, and Dan, I noticed Dan is perhaps, um, I don't know, somewhere between the addiction and the disease. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was classic when, when Dan ended the, the panel by saying that, well, the conclusion of this discussion is that we will have another discussion on the Balkans <laughs> focused on the media. I mean, it was, it was, it was perfect. But... Um, thank you to my colleagues, and, and I, I, I fully intend to share all of the, the honor, the glory, the, um, the, the cash that comes with this award. Um, <laughs> everything will be equally distributed uh, with all my colleagues as a token of my appreciation. Um, thirdly, I want to thank the people in uh, the region, both in Europe, uh, also in the United States, uh, those uh, members of civil society, um, I mentioned the think tanks, uh, the free media, uh, independent media, uh, who are carrying on the same kind of causes, the same kind of fight that many of the, the so-called professionals in the government and outside of the government, are, but are doing it without the kind of uh, support, without the armies or without the diplomatic corps, without the vast resources. Um, civil society and media play an incredibly important role and I want to congratulate and commend all of the journalists, uh, all of the NGOs, all of the think tankers out there who are trying to advance the causes that uh, some of the panels mentioned, the, the strengthening of rule of law, 
the further integration, the further economic and political reforms uh, that the countries of the regions um, know themselves they need, but without being pushed, without being helped, uh, will, will not be possible. I think uh, I lastly need to thank um, the institutions that are, as Mike mentioned, the institutions are, of course, important, so are the people behind them. Um, the, uh, the Program for Conflict Management, uh, the Center for Transatlantic uh, Relations, the um, SICE, the School of Advanced International Studies, are performing, I think, a great service, um, not, not just in uh, the, the awards that they can confer or the events that they organize like this, but in making possible for future generations to continue, to, uh, to inspire um, students and uh, young people who might not otherwise ever be attracted to either a career in uh, journalism or foreign policy. So um, I think we, we all owe um, a great debt of gratitude to, to SICE and other institutions, universities that are, that are doing uh, similar, similar work. Um, very lastly, I think uh, what uh, I mentioned about uh, cash, of course, there is no, in case there's a State Department lawyer in the audience, there is no cash involved in this, 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 this award. But there, there is a great value. And I think the value in the award of this type, the, the panel discussion today, is in affirming um, very clearly the value of diplomacy, um, an institution, uh, and practice, an art, as some would say, that has recently come under fire, under criticism, perhaps into question um, as to whether it is still valuable. And I want to join those who spoke before me in congratulating uh, Matt Nimitz and the, the wider team. And uh, it goes back years, um, back many years, in fact, uh, including many diplomats who were involved in it. But I think what Matt Nimitz was able to do um, was uh, uh, not miraculous because it was based, I think, on um, some, some really intense diplomacy. And by highlighting um, the importance of this institution, I think uh, you are, um, are uh, performing a valuable service. So I'll conclude this, this long thank you, uh, Oscar-like uh, acceptance uh, uh, remarks, just by saying that I hope very much that uh, there will be um, people in the United States, but also in Europe, um, who will see the uh, important role that diplomacy pays or, plays, or more broadly, public service is in um, championing the kind of life that uh, they, that we all want. Um, what uh, this group of uh, Balkan addicts um, and uh, the, the team that produced the agreement um, between Skopje and Athens, I think, has shown is that a, a small group of highly dedicated, sometimes disturbed, but highly dedicated <laughs> and talented people um, can achieve um, great things or um, can achieve at least um, uh, in making a difference. So I hope that there will be uh, students uh, at SAIS around the world that will see, uh, seize the opportunity um, to challenge the status quo uh, to be willing to work for change and to believe that by engaging, uh, they can make a difference. Thank you. So I think that concludes our uh, event today. I want to thank everyone for joining us and uh, hope to see you next time. Thank you. It's not the Nevolin, that's the Nesloch. Yeah, of course.